Good to be here today. Hallelujah. I'm old and it's cold. <laughs> I'll be glad when it warms up. I want to get back our lesson today now, where we started uh, last week, or the week before, rather. Was I here last Sunday? I was here Sunday. It was Wednesday I wasn't here. And uh, I want you to turn with me to the book of Jeremiah. Chapter number 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse number 5. Father, Lord, I pray now that you bless the messenger. The word's already been blessed. It cannot be improved upon. I pray that you give me wisdom, understanding, and scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. The uh, book of Jeremiah says in chapter 1, verse 5, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet to the nations. Now, the uh, scripture is very clear about something, and that is that God made man in his own image. Now, I've got an article here from the Washington Post, New York Post, rather, the New York Post, says scientists could one day make humans immortal. And occasionally the uh, elite will come out and let you know what they're doing. And this, of course, is what they're doing. Let me read it again. Scientists could one day make humans immortal. All right. Now, uh, obviously, that means that they are working toward uh, eternal life without God. And... Uh, this is, of course, is what the devil promised Eve. He said, ye shall not die. And, of course, Satan's a liar, has been. He's the father of lies, created lies. And the Bible very clearly teaches that when Adam and Eve sinned, they died spiritually, and then Adam died 930 years after his creation. So uh, either God is true or the devil is true. And, of course, you believe God, and I do too. Last week, I mentioned now, I started into the biological cellular structure of the human body. I'm going to give you this on uh, just piecemeal here and there as we deal with the issue week after week after week. But um, some of you fresh out of high school or some of you in college right now are fresh out of college. You may have had this, a lot of this material, so it's maybe simply a refresher for you. Some of you, it's probably brand new. And uh, you need to understand something before I go any further. There's an e there's a, there is an enormous amount of research being done right now on the uh, cellular structure and the workings of the human body. Uh, it's the matter of replication and uh, the matter of uh, the, uh, the... They're trying to go in and now they're trying to take uh, a cell from a human body... And they're trying to coax it into becoming uh, some other part of the body. I told you before that uh, embryonic stem cells uh, come into existence about five days after fertilization. Five days in what's uh, in uh, in a uh, in a little sack, and they take the if they can take that cell out of that sack, they can. Uh, with a stem cell, it can become any part of the body. And that's quite a remarkable thing. Uh, it's called a blastocyst. And inside that are these little cells. And this is right before they become, uh, uh, what do they call them, specialized, before they become specialized cells. Now, let me... Uh, let me uh, try to uh, put this together in a sense to where you and I both can understand it. They say that your body is made up of anywhere from, it depends on who you're reading and the source you get, anywhere from uh, 20 to 60 trillion cells. They're about to arrive at a figure of about 37 plus trillion cells. Now how in the world they got there is quite a long thing, but 
To just wrap your mind around that figure, 37, let's just take the 37. I watched a video yesterday and the man was adamant that it's 50 trillion. But uh, who in the world can count them? <laughs> you know. So let's just take it in the general sense that your body has 37 trillion cells. That's 37, all right, that's 37,000 billion. Get it in context. Now, let me give you an idea of what a, what a trillion is. If you spend a million dollars every day for the last 2,000 years, every day you spend a million dollars over the last 2,000 years, you will have spent less than $800 billion, which is less than $1 trillion. It takes a thousand billion to make a trillion. Now... Man's been here 6,000 years. If you took, judging by that figure, from the time that Adam was created until you're sitting here right now in this building, 6,000 years, and spent a million dollars every single day for 6,000 years, all right, you would have spent about 2.4, 2.5, somewhere in there, trillion dollars. All right? That's a period of 6,000 years, a million dollars every single day. You would have spent, you would have spent about 2.4, 2.5 trillion dollars. Your body has 37 approximately trillion cells in it. Each one of these cells is active and alive. They're basically two different kinds of cells. One cell has a nucleus. It has an area of liquid around it called the cytoplasm, and then it has the area that seals the cell called the membrane. These cells are communicating with each other all the time. There is a constant communication going on inside your body of these 37 trillion cells. They tell us that there's anywhere from 500 to 600 billion, billion, galaxies in the universe. I don't know how they know that. Take that with a ton of salt. All right? <laughs> Take it with a ton of salt. But if you look at the figure of how many cells that you have in your body, 37 plus trillion cells in your body, your body, one human body, has enough cells in it to go back and forth to the sun 500 to 600 times, your one body, if all your cells were stretched out in a complete total line, you're looking at an enormous, unbelievable distance to take that DNA, take the DNA that programs that cell to become what it is. Just imagine of how complicated, complex your human body is. Take that figure, seven, 37 trillion cells, and multiply it times 7 billion, because that's how many people are on the earth, approximately, alive right now. 7 billion times 37 trillion. Now, I run out of fingers and toes. I can't figure that for you. Uh, that's a big figure, folks. <laughs> 7 billion times 37 trillion. That's how many cells are on this earth right now interacting with each other alive and doing what they were made to do. Now, how many of you have digested what I've said to you so far? That's a... <laughs> and they will have read, they'll readily admit this. I've watched enough of these videos to get... To, to, they disagree, some of them, many of them do, no doubt, they disagree on some of the issues involved in how things happen inside the body as it relates to cells, replication, so forth and so on. When you get into the business of molecular biology that as it relates to the human body, you're going to get into an enormous, immense world. And you're also getting, you're going to get into a world that, that is, for all intent and purpose, as far as I'm concerned, infinitesimal. In other words, there's, there's no end to it. The reason there's no end to it is because they don't know so many things about what causes things to happen. Let me give you something I didn't give you last week now. 
The double spiraled helix is the DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, all right? It pairs with what's called ribonucleic acid or RNA. There's a number of different RNAs, not just one type. There's a number of them. But in order for your cell to replicate, this DNA must be unzipped, all right? Because it has base pairs, they call it. Now, there's only four substances that make up these base pairs, just four. They're called nucleotides. Adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Just four. Now, just think about this. You've got trillions of cells in your body, but here are just four nucleotides. They, have a, they, call, them, uh, they call them a nitrogenous base or a nitrogenous nucleotide. They have plenty of words, names for all this stuff, so they can communicate with each other. But they are joined like this, okay? They're joined like this. They come together like this. Now, four of them, all right? They always connect with their counterpart. And their counterpart is adenine with thymine, cytosine with guanine. Or it can be thymine with adenine and guanine with cytosine. In other words, you may have, you may have, you may have, uh, you may have thymine here and adenine over here. But you move on down and you'll have it reversed. But it's still the same. It's always they're connected with the same, with, with their counterpart. They don't cross over. They're connected with their counterpart, all right? Now, there's only four of them. You've got four of them. And they're connected with a very, they call it, a, a, I don't know what the word, what's the word they use? A, not a strong hydrogen connection. But they are connected with a hydrogen connection. And that's what this enzyme helicase does. It goes down through there and it, splits that. It causes them to come apart. It causes them to come apart. You see? It's done its job. Now, there is a, a polymerase, it's called, another enzyme that takes the sides. Once you separate them, you've got two sides. You've got two originals. What we're going to do now is make a copy of each original so we have two that came from one. That's where the polymerase comes in. It goes into this side that's been separated, and it rebuilds it, takes all the coating necessary, and creates a double spiraled helix. Does the same thing on the other side, but it's a little more complicated than that. Because if you have these two, you've got the two rugs, you call, look at it like a ladder. You've got this side, that side, holding up the rungs in the center. This is made of a phosphate, sugar, and then you have the poly, you have the you have the the bases. Same on the other side, but one is running in one direction, and the other is running in the other direction. And each complements the other, but you can't flip them up and and just join them together as you please. You've got to do it exactly the way it was originally made. You can't just step out. You got to do exactly the way it's made. So here's what happens. When you take these rungs that are going through the DNA and you begin to look at how they lay, they're laid out because they're not all the same for everybody. That's where the gene comes in. The gene is part of the DNA that has a specific code coded into it to either do something, give a command or something like that. For example, I'm talking to you in English, but if I said to you, stand up, I, had, I have just given you a command, right? Using the English language. That's what DNA is. DNA is the language. Genes are the instruction. Okay? That's important. That's very important. Because just recently they charted the whole human genome. They say they did. They know all the genes that make up a human, a human being. All right? So they know the genetic structure of a man. They understand all the, well, as far as they know, they understand the connection here we have with this double spiraled helix. It's zipped apart. Duplicates or replicates, replicates. Now we had started with one. We got two, and I'm very, I'm simplifying this thing greatly because there's a whole lot more going on than simply what I'm saying. But I'm trying to give you an overview of what's going on here because it's important, and I'm going to tell you why it's important. 
When you start looking at that, you have to say to yourself, how in the world can anybody believe that something as complicated as this, and they haven't figured it out yet anyway, could have just evolved? It is mind-boggling. I have to say to the person, you don't respect me, you have contempt for me, and you're arrogant when you try to ram evolution down somebody's mind who's done any reading at all into this. A man's a fool when he buys into evolution. But anyway, you got all of these rungs connecting with each other, okay? After a while, you start looking at them and a pattern begins to develop. You see, when you leave part of your DNA somewhere at a crime scene, they take that, all right? They take that, and they put that under a microscope. And they begin, well, the processes, they've got a number of them they use to determine who you're connected with. Because, you see, this replication and this replication here came from an original. And this is why they're able to replicate it, because if you took the inside part away, you could bring them back together again, because they only match up with certain ones. So if they've only got part of one, they can match it up, because they know it's got to be the other thing on the other side. If they've got an adenine, they have to have a thymine. See what I mean? They have to have. So this is what they call, uh, what is it, they, what's the term? I had it fresh in my mind a moment ago. Uh, sequencing. Sequencing. When they get into DNA sequencing, that's what they get into. It not only tells you who they are, it tells you where they came from. It tells you who their mother is, who their father is. It traces back in their, in their, in their, in their genealogy. And that's a big deal today because you can take DNA and you can tell if you are the biological father or the biological mother. And it's done by sequencing. It's done by looking at these bases where they come together and how the pattern develops, because the pattern is not the same for everybody. That tells me that every single one of us on the face of this earth is an individual. Ever, nobody on this earth has your DNA. Unless you are an identical twin. And then I, I read where there's some kind of a break in there. But if you're identical twins, they both share the same DNA. Okay, Fraternal twins do not. But identical twins is one egg fertilized that splits, and you have two, you have you have two children born from one fertilized egg that has split. That is an identical twin with the same DNA. Let me tell you something else about identical twins with the same DNA. This is important. They can come out of the womb with identical copies of their bodies, but completely different people living inside that body. Yes, sir. One of them can be can be can can be a decent human being, the other one a piece of garbage. Yet they're identical twins. So there's more going on to who you are, right, than your body. All right. Now, when that egg is fertilized, the moment the fertilization takes place, there's a flash of light. A lot of people believe that that is the moment of human conception. In plain words, at that moment, a human being has been conceived. Five days later, you've got all of these embryonic stem cells. There's a process going on here because you're going to, these, these cells are going to begin to specialize. They're going to begin to develop. They call it a zygote, a little thing that looks like a, you know, doesn't look like much like a human being. But it, uh, it continues to develop and develop and develop and develop until, uh, until you've got what looks like a little human being inside the womb. All right? That's a big deal. Because all of this was done with the wisdom of God putting in the womb of a woman a human being. That child is born from a human. A human begets a human. As God said in the book of Genesis, everything after its own kind. Now remember, I just read to you a moment ago how that scientists could one day make humans immortal. How are they going to do that? All right. They've got, some, they've got some tricks up their sleeve. They're working very hard right now on artificial wombs. What's an artificial womb? An artificial womb is a womb that is outside of a woman, 
but it can be used to develop an embryo, a child, fetus, a baby, and bring it forth to birth. All right? But you've got an artificial womb. You've got artificial insemination. You've got cloning. You've got everything else involved with it. All of it's done outside the womb. So from, so from conception till birth, we're going to have babies that were never inside of a human being. Now digest that for a moment. You say, well, that won't happen. People are ethical. They are hogwash. If they can make a dollar bill off of it, they'll make a dollar bill. Do you have any trust in mankind? I have zero trust when it comes to ethics and, uh, and the scientific community. They say they've already, they've already done this, that they have embryos now growing in artificial wombs. And uh, say, so why would they want to do that, preacher? Well, for one thing, if you raise embryos in an artificial womb, you can do it. Uh, uh, let's just say... You can control the development up until you get to a point to where you have organs that can be harvested. In plain words, there are a lot of people waiting for a heart. They're waiting for a kidney. They're waiting for body parts. And they, they can be harvested. In other words, you're just growing like a garden. You're raising human beings in artificial wombs so that one day you can come in there and you can take their organs. Because after all, they're not really human according to the new definition of science. Watch the way they do this now. Let me give you a warning this morning. Watch the way the so-called scientific community begins to define what makes a human being. Watch them. Because they will, their motive in doing that will be that they can raise human... <laughs> I call them a human being, whatever... But they're not liable for a murder or for killing because it's simply a crop that they're raising. All right? There's a lot of ethical issues involved in this. But this is the brave new world that you're living in right now. Let's say you have a couple and they want to have, ch they want to have children. Let's say, for example, you have a couple of sodomites. They want to have children. Well, obviously, they cannot have children. The reason they cannot have children is because it's unnatural. There's no way under the sun that you can make it anything but that. But they want to have children. So what do they do? They appealed to the scientific community that they will take the, uh, the, 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 the cellular structure like the embryonic cells. Uh, well, it wouldn't be from, a, from, a fema, from, a, from, from, from two males, but they would take like they're working with a cell, like the adult cell, the adult stem cell. Let me explain that. There are two stem cells in your body. One is the embryonic stem cell, which is about five days after fertilization. That can be, become anything. But now they're working with what they call adult stem cells. And this is, this is being done so they can take a specialized organ in the body or cell in the body and they can coax it into becoming a stem cell again. And from that stem cell, then they, of course, can hopefully grow whatever they want to do with it. This is what they're doing. They're working toward that end. So let's say they do that, all right? And they've taken that. And so one of these homosexuals will have a child born with their own DNA, the DNA from the homosexual. You see what I mean? Like he was a biological father, but it's all done without a woman being involved. This is where we're headed. We're headed in that direction. Now, remember last week I mentioned to you how that Vladimir Putin said that we are going to genetically develop a super soldier. Remember that? And through the gene structure, they're going to breed into these people all of the characteristics they want. For example, they could run as fast as an Olympic sprinter. They'd be able to go on the battlefield for days and not have to eat and this and that, no rest and all this. Well, all this stuff comes down to you personally as an individual, and it relates to you. It relates to who you are. It relates to how you live. A lot of people out there, they say, well, I don't want to hear all that. Well, you're going to hear it. There's nothing you can do to stop it. What you need to do today is to be informed. You need to know to be informed about what's coming. Now, Revelation chapter 13, 
says that the false prophet will have power to give life to the image of the beast, right? They have power to give life to the image of the beast. All right. Most of the most of the of, of the interpretation of that has been that it will be some kind of a mechanical device that all of a sudden in the in the sight of the people comes to life. In other words, like you'd fire up an engine or something like that. I think there's something far more sinister involved in what's going on here than simply a machine. People will know a machine, and how in the world is that going to fool anybody? But if you've got a body that has been grown in an artificial womb, and artificial intelligence has been merged or married to that body, now you've got something like, you know Sophia, they've got her all over YouTube. She can talk to you, answer questions, so forth, converse with you. Now you have a body that's been grown in an, art, in, in, in a, in an artificial womb, and this body has been merged with artificial intelligence. Now we're going out into sci-fi land like you wouldn't believe. A cyborg. Something that is neither human nor machine, but a combination of both. In plainer words, it's not beyond belief that you will have people walking around on this earth that have no navel. No navel. They were created in a test tube and raised in a in a artificial womb. And now the ethical question you have to ask yourself, what are you dealing with? What is that? Is that a human being with a soul or what is it? Did you know over there in the book of Genesis chapter number 6 and the Bible said the sons of God saw the daughters of men that came into them and giants were born in those days. The Hebrew word for giant is Nephilim from the Greek from the Hebrew verb Nephal which means fallen ones. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah and I think it's chapter 24. It refers to them as the Raphaim or the Rapha. And it says that thou hast visited them and destroyed them and they have no resurrection. They're not human beings. They're not accountable as human beings. He visited them and he destroyed them. Because they were neither angel nor human. They were hybrids. A cross between the two. Now today you see a lot of chimeras. Today you see an awful lot of stuff where you're mixing human with animal. This is coming. They're, what they're doing, they're taking, they're taking embryos, and I'm sure they're doing this. They're taking human embryos and implanting them in the wombs of animals. Pig, for example. And that child, after, the, after nine months, comes out of the womb of a pig. So can you imagine what you've done to a child if a pig is its mother? Who has the right to do that? The generation you live in has a philosophy. And that philosophy is simply this. We have evolved to this point and nothing is going to stop us from evolving further. No Bible, no morality, no ethics, nothing. If it's good for mankind as we see it, we're going to do it. Now that's the idea. That's the attitude. How many of you understand that Silicon Valley? How many know what I'm talking about when I say Silicon Valley? All right. When we get into software and computers and all of that stuff, that's Silicon Valley. How many of you realize that there is a philosophy in Silicon Valley that is completely different from you? It is so foreign to the way you think that you, you, couldn't, you wouldn't believe it. In Silicon Valley, they have orgies. And this is coming from more than one source. And they have these orgies on a regular basis. And now they are flaunting it in the face of everybody else because they don't believe it doesn't matter to them what you think about it. This is the new world and the new norm. See? All right. These are the people that are writing your programs, that are programming your computers, that are in the high techno technology field. This is the elite of the elite when it comes to computers and when it comes to all this other stuff. This is Silicon Valley. All right. 
And here and there, a whistleblower will come out and he'll say, oh, yes, this is what's happening and so forth. And people, some people, they can't believe it because it doesn't happen that way around here on Woodrow Drive. But you live in a big world. And there's an awful lot of people out there that have absolutely no constraints whatsoever. And so they will experiment with human beings. And I can't help but believe that somewhere in this experimentation, the hand of God will bring about the Antichrist. Just exactly how this is going to happen, I don't know. I can't tell you. But he's coming. He may already be here. This man of sin, son of perdition, has a deadly wound and it's healed after three days. He mimics the resurrection of Christ. It's remarkable when you think about what's going on in the world of genetics. It's mind-boggling at how quickly everything is moving, how fast-paced it all is today. It just simply blows my mind. Listen to Charles Krauthammer in this book, Xenogenesis, Stephen Quayle. This is from Brother David Valance. He loaned me this book the other day. He knows a good book. If you're interested, Xenogenesis, you can get it on Amazon. I ordered me a copy of it two or three days ago. Xenogenesis means foreign genesis. Xeno's foreign. Xenophobia, they like to throw it in your face all the time, how that you have a fear and a natural fear of a foreigner. That's what xenophobia is about. So xenogenesis simply means uh, it, an origin of a foreign origin. And here, of course, you see a flying saucer. Here's a baby and uh, double spiral helix, DNA and all that on the cover. I recommend this book. I haven't read every word of it, but I've been through it. And uh, this is a good read right here. Xenogenesis by Stephen Quayle. How many of you have, uh, I won't let, don't raise your hand, but how many of you have bothered to look at YouTube and look at that flash of light at the very moment when that egg is fertilized? If you haven't seen it, go do it. If you can remember, I know a lot of times you forget and you get busy and this and that and so forth. But if you can think of it, log on to YouTube and type in there, flash of light, fertilization, and you will be amazed at what you see. And, of course, you know, that was only about five years ago they discovered that. It hadn't been long. But Krauthammer, which I don't always agree with, He's been having some physical problems here recently. But listen to what this man says. And by the way, he's got a picture in here of Leonardo da Vinci, a baby in a womb. And da Vinci, when was it, 1500s? 14th century? I think da Vinci's the 1500s, uh, 1400s, 1400s, 13th century. And da Vinci, he, he, was, he was very, uh, he had a mind that wanted to know what was going on. Here's Krauthammer. On the implantation in a non-human species, let me just propose three possible reasons for why you'd object to this. The first you might simply call the yuck factor. The second would have to do with it being a kind of violation of the prohibition on experimentation without consent. And the third having to do with social control. The first would simply be the idea of having a child born of a pig. To put it rather bluntly, something you wouldn't wish on your own child that is simply, without reflection, repugnant. Although they may not be a sufficient reason, although that may not be a sufficient reason, but that would be number one. Would you put that on anybody? A child being born of a pig? Who's your mother? Show them a picture of a, a pig. The second would be the fact that we know that the womb has some kind of a Physiological effect on the embryo. Now, Krauthammer's a doctor. Now, listen to this. It's not all internally determined by the innate development of the embryonic tissue itself. There's an interaction with the uterus and the host. We don't know what those effects would be. We don't know whether or not there would be any pig-like influences on a child. Or there could be other kinds of influences which do not have to do with mixing, but simply might be injurious. And that would be kind of a safety issue, and that would be almost insoluble, because how would you do the experiment on the first child without harming it? The third, I think, is the most interesting, because it generalizes and it goes like this. 
Why do we want the embryo to be housed in its mother? Now listen to this man. One of the reasons is that it creates an innate connection between the child and the mother. And the mother becomes uniquely protective and attached. That's human nature. It's even animal nature as well. That even applies in a surrogate mother. And we saw that in cases where the surrogate refuses to give up the child. That connection is immediate. It's innate. And it's very powerful. And the reason it's useful and it's also human and it's required is because the child is entirely unprotected in the world, entirely defenseless, and by being housed, if you lack in the womb, it acquires a protector instantly, permanently, and indissolubly. Once you break that connection by placing it in an animal, which would be the first stage of perhaps placing it in some kind of artificial medium, in other words, a artificial womb, in the farther future, that child remains defenseless. And the social implication of that are that it could then become an instrument, a possession of whoever controls the medium, the animal, or the official womb. See what I mean? In other words, you create a thing unattached to any human and therefore subject to complete social control by the state, by the company, or by whoever is doing this. So it would be very interesting as to how the Supreme Court would relate to someone like What kind of rights would they have, you see? You were born of a pig. It's not the mixing or the yucking that's at issue here. It may be severing the connection between the child and the mother, which is a way of protecting that child by giving him a belonginghood to someone who will care. Once you put him in an animal which is a thing for these purposes, or a machine, which might happen in the future, you create a completely atomized and defenseless creature, and that opens the way to all kinds of tyrannies, social control, and lack of autonomy, which we would not want. If you create an industry in which you have these embryos being carried by non-human carriers, or in machines, artificial womb, you can make limitless production of these, and you're going to assume all of them are going to be lining up outside for adoption? Of course not. In other words, you're raising your own crop of hearts, kidneys, liver, and on it goes. And when that happens, then you're going to look at your society and you're going to say, well, I'm a real human being, and this one's not. And it's going to have profound psychological effects on humanity because it's going to take another step down the road. Charles Darwin dehumanized you. If you believe in evolution, he has reduced you to a pig. If you buy into Darwinism, your humanity is gone. Have you ever noticed this? When I was a kid... We patted our dogs. And I had an old stray, every old stray came through the place, man, my brother and I, we'd take it in. We would. Every old stray, we'd take it in. They were hybrid dogs back in those days. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> but today, have you noticed the trend? Now just watch this. This coming week, watch the trend. Nine times out of ten, if you see a human being and a dog, the dog will be licking the human being in the mouth. How many of you have noticed that? I suppose on down the road, the human being will be licking the dog in the mouth. You say, yuck. Yeah, yuck. <laughs> if you know what dogs do, you'd be yucking all right. <laughs> You better believe you'd be yucking. No, what, you, what have we done, though? Here's what we've done. Not we, of course. I'm talking about so-called humanity. Here's what they're doing. They're putting the dog on the same level as a human being. You ever notice that? Have you noticed how they're breaking down the walls between animal and human? You ever watch it? You ever watch it? Have you ever, have you ever watched how 
that they get so upset about some lost pet or some dog or some cat, and then they make mention of a human being over here as if it's no big deal. You ever notice that? Have you ever noticed the laws that are being passed today that seem like they have far more concerned about a little four-legged creature? And there's nobody in here this house wants to harm, a, harm animals. If you want to harm animals, you've got a problem. I'm not defending anything. I'm trying to, trying to make an observation. You are being brainwashed. Your mind is being conformed. They're, they're constantly, constantly, constantly bashing you. Flashing before your eyes, preaching to you their doctrine. And they're brainwashing people through the TV and through everything else. And you've gotten to the point now to where uh, that, uh, that animals are going to have the same rights as a human being. How many of you see that coming? We're not far from it. Not far at all. Pardon? Yeah, of course. Sophia is... Uh, uh, if now, how many of you have ever thought about this? You can go to the animal world, all right. Ever last four legged, six legged, thirty legged centipede, whatever you find out there. Hundred leg, what's a centipede? Hundred legs, whatever you find out there. I don't care where you find it, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Have you ever seen a zoo with people in the zoo and the dogs walking up and down and looking in at the people? So that's ludicrous. You know why? Because a man is infinitely smarter than the smartest of the animals. Do you know why? Watch them. Animals can only reach a certain level of intelligence. They only get so smart. And it seems like the smartest of all the animals can only rise so high, and that's it. There's a, there's a barrier they cannot cross. But a human being, your mind begins to open up. It begins to expand. And as God shows you, you can learn more and more and more and more and more. We take things today as old hat that 150 years ago would have blown people away. 150 years ago, nobody would have, You start talking about DNA, genetics, and all of that. They know what you're talking about. What in the world are you talking about? And now we can manipulate genes and with CRISPR Cas9, Jennifer Dudna, professor out here at UCLA who discovered this, she watched bacteria. Now watch this, how she did it. She watched bacteria fight off viruses. That sparked her interest, okay? Now she thought, how do these bacteria fight off viruses? So she watched it. And over time, through processes of success, failure. She, people say in, bio, they say in biology, they say, if you're afraid of failing, forget it. So there's a lot of failure. But then there's success. She saw how that that bacteria was able to re-genetic, re re-gene, reprogram the gene and fight off a virus. And she watched how it did it. And she took that knowledge... And she developed what we know today as CRISPR-Cas9, and that is genetic engineering in, in right now on the highest level you can get because you can go in there and literally cut a gene, cut another one, cut one, cut here, and put together what you want, and now you have redesigned the genetic code. And that's what Jennifer Dudna did. I would suggest that you go to YouTube, type her name in, She's the lady that discovered this. Brilliant woman, no question about it. And listen to her as she lectures the scientist. Where she started from, how she got there, and the potential for what she's going to do with CRISPR-Cas9. And it'll blow your mind. And it's here right now. I've talked to uh, a number of people in the medical profession field. And... Uh, some of them, I can tell by what, they, by what they say that they haven't been reading because it's so new, they're not up on it. They don't know what's going on with CRISPR-Cas9. The fact of the matter is that when my wife came, with Guillain -Barre, came down with Guillain-Barre syndrome a few years back, I talked to some MDs. And they vaguely remember, 
reading something about it in their medical textbook when they went through med school, and some of them didn't have a clue. That's not being critical. Not a bit. That's being observant. There is so much stuff out there today that one man cannot keep up with it. Can't do it. You can't do it. I told my cardiologist, I said, I'm having a, I'm having a cryonic, a cryonic ablation done to my, uh, to my uh, kidney. A cryonic ablation uh, done to my kidney. He said, what's that? That's not being critical. Because he's an outstanding cardiologist. He's a heart doctor, see. No one man can keep up with all of it. I'm trying to tell you that there is such an unbelievable amount of information available to get into this stuff. And I'm trying to take what I think is relevant and give it to you and show you where it's leading. And that's what we'll get into next week, Lord willing. Show you where it's leading. Show you how it affects you. That's what's important. That's my responsibility as a pastor to minister to my generation, the generation of 2018. Not the generation of 1950, the generation of 2018. Father, bless your word. Bless the folks that have heard it. I pray you'd meet with us in a few minutes as we come together and worship your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray.